teaching out of Matthew chapter 6. If you guys turn to Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, I've entitled today's message, The God of Your Tomorrow. The God of Your Tomorrow. And I'll be looking at verses 25 through 34. And verses 25 to 34 is the end of chapter 6. So what I'll do is I'm going to read verses 25 through 34. Jesus speaking says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow and they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the, into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For, all, for after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But first, or seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You know, most of us, I guess most of our worries are not about today. They're usually about tomorrow, next week, perhaps next month. We can plan for the future. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we can prepare for tomorrow, but not fully. Uh, only one person knows what's going to happen tomorrow, and that is God. It's very clear in Scripture that God is the one who is in control of your tomorrow. In fact, we're not even promised tomorrow. I mean, we can plan for tomorrow, but you just don't know what God has in mind. Uh, he could take us home tomorrow. We don't know. But we don't know about tomorrow, and we're not promised tomorrow. But God wants us to live for today and trust him with our tomorrow. And what we see here is very clearly that the Bible makes it clear about boasting about tomorrow. Listen to this, uh, uh, Proverbs 27, 1, it says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. I'm sure you've had those days where you planned for something for the next day, and it did not happen. And you were probably bummed, right? I mean, I didn't plan to be here today. I, I didn't. I didn't plan to be here today. I got the word from our pastor, and, and, and I said, yeah, you know, I, I'll, I'll get here. I'll be here. And, and he had, same thing with him. He wasn't planning. He was planning on being here, but things changed. So, so we can plan, but, but we have to remain flexible for God to do what he needs to do and not to be so strong with, with what we want to do for the next day. There's so much stress there's so much fear, doubt, and uncertainty in many people's hearts today. That people live weighed down by worry. And, and, and we see here that Matthew chapter 6 is an important chapter. The entire chapter, because what Jesus is doing, Jesus is teaching us important lessons about the Christian life. And I'm just going to kind of give you a quick little rundown of this entire chapter, leading us up to our study tonight, just to kind of give you the context of chapter 6. But we see here that Jesus gives us some pretty big lessons about the Christian life. At the beginning of chapter 6, he warns us about hypocrisy. He tells us, don't give to be seen by others. Don't hold up your check when you're putting it in the box, all right? He says, you know what? Don't do that. That's hypocrisy, he says. He, then he teaches us how to pray. He says, you know what? Here's how not to pray, with vain repetitions. You know, God is a God of relationship. You know, and we see here that God says, you know, about hypocrisy. He warns us about hypocrisy. He warns us about vain repetitions. And then he taught us about the importance of forgiveness. The importance of forgiveness. And then Jesus, again, later in this chapter, he goes back to hypocrisy and teaches us on the wrong way too fast. In other words, don't let other people know you're fasting. You know, I remember years ago, I had one guy come to me and say to me, look at my face. Do you see anything different? I said, no, there's nothing different. Maybe there's a pimple on it, but there's, a, you know... <laughs> And this young guy was serious, and he says to me, I've been fasting for a week. I said, you just lost your reward, dude. I mean, serious? You're just telling me that you're fasting. That's exactly what Jesus said, don't do. And we see here that Jesus goes back to the hypocrisy and says, don't do that. 
And then he encourages us to lay up heavenly treasures and not earthly treasures because there are thieves here. There, there are people who can steal your possessions. So finally, as Jesus comes to the end of chapter 6, we see here that Jesus made it clear that you cannot serve God and material things. As it says there, you cannot serve God and mammon. It's an Aramaic word that uh, speaks of riches. So what Jesus does then, after he concludes or finishes this, he concludes chapter 6 by focusing on worry. And he touches on worry for a little bit. He actually expands a little bit on worry. And the lesson Jesus taught his disciples and the lesson that he wants to teach here tonight to you and to me is this, do not worry about tomorrow. It's a very simple lesson, yet it's very hard, isn't it? It's very challenging. And what we see here, that Jesus repeats this four times in the last nine verses of chapter 6. And this kind of will be our outline. Verse 25, do not worry about your life. Verse 26, do not worry about clothing. Verse 27, do not worry about food. And verse 28, do not worry about tomorrow. Jesus can't get any more clear on what he's trying to convey to you and to me, and that is simply do not worry about tomorrow. And he hits it hard. Back and forth, he reminds us. So let's look at the first one. Jesus introduces this section, do not worry about your life. This is the way he introduces it. Notice what he says there. Very first thing in verse 25, he says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. Now, this phrase, do not worry, the way it is written in the original Greek language, basically is to stop an action that is already going on. So it is as if Jesus is saying, quit uh, what he's saying is, I know most of you are worrying, so stop. That's what it says. That's the whole force behind this phrase, do not worry. What he's saying is stop that activity now. Quit being weighed down by your thoughts. He says, Jesus is telling him to stop it. Have you ever told somebody just to stop it? I tell that to my four-year-old when she gets all crazy. Stop it, right? Sometimes you just have to tell people, stop it. And as Christians, sometimes we can get so weighed down with worry that sometimes somebody has to tell us, hey, stop it. Seriously, stop it. And, and we see here, this is exactly what Jesus is telling his disciples. He's telling them to stop it. I love the way Jesus is straightforward here, isn't it? Don't you love that? How he's just straight out to these disciples and to us, obviously. Now, what does the word worry mean? Well, the word worry means to be concerned or being anxious or to be anxious. That's what the word means. It's when you're concerned and you're anxious. And he uses the word life. Life is obviously life in, in general sense here that we're going to look at here, the necessities of life. And when we talk about life, and we can spend hours talking about life, but life can be very, very hard at times. Perhaps there are some in here tonight who are going through a very hard time right now. Or perhaps there are going to be some of you who are going to go through a very hard time in life. And, and we're going to see here that Jesus here basically makes it clear that life is unpredictable. And you know, if you've been around a long time, you know that life is very unpredictable. Life really, as much as you want to make life predictable, it doesn't, you won't be able to. You can't do it. It's very hard. Jesus never promised us that life will be all easy, that it would actually be easy all the time. You know, I mean, when, when people come to Christ, the, the, the wrong thing to tell them is that once you come to Jesus, all your problems will be over. There's a theology out there that actually says that. That's the Word of Faith movement. It's like you come to Christ and listen, you, you're going to have money in your bank account. You know, you get to have a helicopter and, and you're going to have the riches from heaven transferred into your account to dollars. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's a theology out there that actually dupes people. So when they go through a hard time in life, what happens? They fizzle out. They fizzle out because they believe that coming to Jesus, they believe that being a Christian means that I will not have a problem in life. Right? If you've been around, right, a long time, you're like, uh-uh. There's problem after problem. Some of you guys are probably going through a lot of issues, problems, and whatnot. And, and, but yet, it doesn't change Jesus. It doesn't change the nature of God. And God made it very clear about this thing. Listen to what Jesus said in John 16, 33. He said this, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In other words, in this fallen world, there is tribulation, there is hardships, but in me, Jesus says, there is peace. So it's interesting that the Christian life is lived out in a fallen world that is full of trouble. And to be honest with you, I don't think no one has to think very hard 
to list the troubles that are in this world today. I mean, we can just go on and on and say, just, I want you to list five things that are happening in this world that are troublesome. You could probably come up with more than five. We're surrounded by trouble. We're surrounded by hardships. And as Christians, we're sometimes caught in the crossfire of this fallen world. Because unfortunately, we're not immune to suffering. We're not immune to, 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 to problems and whatnot. That's just, it comes with the territory of, of living in a fallen world. We get sick. You know, we, we have issues. We have things that happen to us. But again, it's because of the fallen nature of the world that we're in. But the thing here that we see here that when you struggle in this world, what Jesus wants you to take from him is his peace. See, if you stay in the world, you're going to get pressure. You're going to get tribulation. You're going to get persecution. Whatever it is that the world will give you as a Christian because they hate you, when you come to Christ, you're going to receive peace. So it's a neat balance that when you're going through a hard time, listen, go to Jesus because he's going to give you peace. He'll give you peace in the midst of your storm. He'll give you the ability. He'll sustain you through those hard times because he is the one who gives you peace. Jesus doesn't dish out trouble. He doesn't dish out hardships. Jesus will give you peace. And that's exactly what he said in John 16. So we see here that it's very clear that Jesus is in full control of your life. And this is kind of like the big picture here. Now, in the immediate context of chapter 6, verses 25 to 34, Jesus is talking about the necessities of life. You know, life here is referring to the necessities, the, the basic things, food, water, clothing. Jesus is saying here, don't be worried or anxious about these things. That's what he's saying. So, notice what it says there. Jesus says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. So, if you're hungry, don't worry about it, all right? I'm going to take two hours teaching. I'm joking. No, I won't do that. Remember Martha? You remember when Martha was serving Jesus? She was doing a pretty good thing, but there's something wrong with, with, with her motive. You know, when Jesus came to her, Martha came to Jesus, she got all distracted serving Jesus and, said, and even got mad at Jesus and said, basically, look at my sister. She's not doing nothing. And Jesus said, ah, she's doing a lot more than you. She's sitting at my feet. This is where you're supposed to be. And we can get all caught up, all busy. And Jesus says, listen, you need to slow down. You need to spend time at my feet. You need to spend time in my word. You need to spend time talking with me. Jesus said in Luke 10, 41, Martha, Martha, you are worried or anxious and troubled about many things. So we see here that Jesus is including the necessities of life. He's talking about food. He's talking about clothing. Now, living in Palestine in those days, we have to understand something here to, to really get what Jesus is saying here. Living in those days was harder, much harder than the way we live our lives here today. And I'll tell you why. If they were to get food, when it comes to food during the time of Christ, you had to raise up the crops, the things to actually have food. It wasn't that easy. Uh, you had to cultivate it, farm it. Or if you went to the marketplace during the time of Jesus, you would hope that you would find the meat and the things that you're looking for, but you weren't guaranteed that you would find that stuff. So it would be a lot harder back then than it is today. Water, for example, back in the time of Christ was a great concern because that part of the world was very semi-dry. So they had to dig wells and whatnot, and it was very, very difficult for them. If there was a drought, you're in trouble. Like we have drought, we're, we're going through a drought right now, but yet you still have water coming out of your faucet, right? These guys, you had drought back in the time of Christ, you're done, you're, you're in trouble. Now, when it comes to clothing, you can probably back in the time of Christ, you can purchase it from someone, but most of the people during the time of Christ made their clothing. They actually did it themselves. So we see here that it's very interesting and very, very clear that when Jesus is saying this to the disciples, to them, it meant more. It was more challenging to them than, than for us to see this. Now, you're saying, well, what do you mean, Robert? It is tough for me to get food. Really? We have Costco's everywhere. We have Walmarts everywhere. Super Walmarts now, right? We have 7-Elevens that are open 24 hours, seven days a week. So if you get hungry at midnight, you can go to 7-Eleven or AMP and get a hot dog. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we are seriously not struggling as bad as we think we are. I mean, if you need food, you can find food at any time at night. This is exactly what we see here, that the people here that lived at this time, when Jesus says, do not worry about your life, food, clothing, water, they're like, what? Are you serious? See, for us, we're like, 
It's okay. Walmart will never go out of, you know, they'll, have, they'll, they'll always stock food in there, you know. But Jesus is saying to them, do not worry about these things. So for them, this was very, very crucial. And we see here that wanting the necessities of life is not bad. Don't, 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 get, don't get Jesus wrong here. He's not saying, you know what, don't drink water anymore. You know, don't drink, don't, don't eat food. You know, he's not saying that. What he's telling us is this, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, is what he's saying. And notice what he says. He says this, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? In other words, what he's saying is this, in this is this how a child of God is to live life, is what he's saying. Do you think that your heavenly father is just going to ignore you? Do you think your heavenly father is going to starve you to death? That's the point that he's actually making. So he built a case on this. Notice in verse 26 and 27, he uses birds. Look at the birds, he says, of the air. For they neither sow, nor reap, nor eat, nor, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So Jesus built a case against worrying, and he says it very clearly in verses 26 to 30. What he's saying is, trust your heavenly Father. And he gives you an illustration by using Tweety Birds. Birds. <laughs> now, have you ever seen a bird stressed out? I've never had a bird come up to the back porch or the back uh, yard and tap on my window, going back and forth like, Please let me in. I need food. You know what I'm saying? I've never seen a bird stress out. These things are free and flying around. I wish I could fly like them sometimes. You know what I mean? It's like, these things look so cool. And Jesus is saying, listen, they don't stress out because your father is feeding them. I mean, God is feeding them. So if you have a bird feeder at home, listen, if you run out of bird seed, don't worry about it. God will take care of it. Save the money. You know what I'm saying? I'm not against bird feeders, but you know what I'm saying. You know, it's interesting here because we see that Jesus is doing the Sermon on the Mount. He's outside, and I love this because it says there in verse 26, it says, look at the birds. So you could see Jesus as he's talking to these guys, a little bird flies. says, so look, guys, see that bird right there? Your heavenly Father feeds them. And they're like, wow, really? Okay, cool. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's kind of neat how he's using the illustration of nature to actually bring this point home. Job said this, Job 38, 41. Who provides food for the raven when its young cries out to God and wonder about for lack of food? It's a rhetorical question. God does. Psalm 147, 9. It says that God gives to the beasts its food and to the young ravens that cry. I mean, we see it's essential to note here that this is the way God is feeding them. This is the way God is actually, you know, taking care of these birds. And this is why it says here very clearly that don't worry about it. You know, I had a bird enter my house through the chimney last year. You know, my wife heard something, you know, the, 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 the wings flapping inside this, you know, hollow uh, chimney. And, and I said, is there a bird in there? I said, I don't think there's a bird in there. They can't, you know, how are they going to get in there? Well, guess what? A bird just fell right through at the bottom. And I'm like, whoa, and it takes off. And the little thing goes upstairs. I'm like, how am I going to get this thing out of here? You know what I'm saying? So here I am, you know, kind of like the, you know, the, the bird hunter here. You know, I get this gloves on and I get this pillowcase. I mean, and I'm Googling, how do you do this? You know, how do you get a bird out without shooting the thing? You know what I'm saying? So I see this bird flying around, hitting the walls, and I'm like, oh, this thing is going to die here. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to break its wing. So finally, as it went into my room, you know, I, I cornered the little thing. And I got the cloth, my, my, my uh, pillowcase, and I just put the little guy in and I just held him kind of gently, you know, and I walked him out and just let him go. And he flew right out. Now, I cared about that bird. I have a four-year-old and a four-month-old baby. I love those two more than that bird. Now, if I'm so gentle and loving over a little bird that could have had rabies, I don't know, you know what I'm saying? But I'm trying to carry this baby and trying to, or this bird. I mean, think about it. I mean, here I am trying to save this thing. How much more would I do that with my kids? If that bird came after my little girl, man, that thing would be done. It would be her lunch that day. You know what I'm saying? I'm serious. So, so I'm just trying to put things into perspective. If I cared for that little bird, listen, I care more for my kids than that bird. Same thing that God is saying here is that, listen, you're worrying about something. Listen, I take care of these birds, and the birds are not as valuable as you are. You're my master creation. That's what Jesus is saying. 
And what we see here is very clearly that Jesus says, I will provide, so don't stress. Now, let me add something here. It's essential to note that this is not an excuse for idleness. Well, if God's going to feed me, then I'm going to sit here and wait for the food to come from heaven. Sorry, Old Testament. We're in the New Testament now. Birds, even though they're fed by God, don't sit on a branch to wait for food to fall on their beak, right? They, they hunt for food. They go out for food. They're, they're looking for food. I've talked to Christians um, that say things like, well, you know, I've, can you pray for me? Sure, what's up? I'm looking for a job. Great. Uh, where have you applied? I'm, I'm not applying. I'm just trusting the Lord. <laughs> Listen, if you get a job like that, please let me know. <laughs> I'm just trusting the Lord. The Lord will provide a job. I know he's going to provide a job. I understand that. But are you applying? Are you moving? Are you going to places? No, the Lord is good. I'm not going to. Listen, that's not biblical. That's not what this is saying. Because, you know, birds do, do things, and they go out for food, but God provides for them. So you tell somebody, say, listen, just go and find a place and apply, and that's how you learn whether the Lord is going to open that door or not. But you just can't sit still and be like, well, God's going to provide a job for me. You know, I'm hungry today. I'm waiting for the lobster. <laughs> Dude, you're going to be there a long time. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, because we see here that this is not what Jesus is talking about. God teaches us to ask, to seek, and to knock, doesn't he? You know, when he says ask, he says, listen, pray. Bring your request to me. Ask. Lord, I want a Tesla. No, I'm joking. I'm not saying it. I'm joking. <laughs> For those of you who know what that is, it's a car. But anyway, who don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah. Can I have a ride next? Anyways. Um, then he says seek. Or he says ask. Then he says seek. In other words, that's where action comes in to play. You begin to seek. You begin to seek the Lord. And through the way you seek the Lord is perhaps by going out to finding, you know, a place to apply for or whatnot. And then he says to knock. You begin to knock on doors. People start calling you back. Go to those interviews. You're knocking on these doors. That's how God works his will in your life. And that's what we see here, that, that we, God is not saying just to be idle, but God will provide the place, to, will provide the job. And that's why he says, are you not more valuable than they, he says. There's a quote from one of my commentators that said this. And I quote, the worry men, many people have over the material things of life is rooted in a low understanding of their value before God. They don't comprehend how much he loves and cares for them. Listen, can I say something to you very practical? God loves you and God cares for you. He loves you and he cares for you. That's not deep, is it? It's truth, though, that God loves you and God cares for you. If you, if you heard in your mind, or if something came in your, th in your, in your head that, that you know, something said like, God doesn't like you, God doesn't care for you. Listen, that's not from the Lord. That's from the devil. Because he's trying to, you know, basically try to, you know, diminish God's love and care that he has over you. And, and it's important for you to understand something very simply. It, whatever you get out of this tonight, I, I hope you walk out with this. God loves you and God cares for you. And, and I know that because the Bible says so. And this is what we're talking about here tonight. It's very important for us to understand because he created us. He created life. He created your life, and he's going to sustain your life. He's not just going to leave you alone. You know, he takes care of the animal kingdom. He's going to sustain our lives as human beings. So we see here very clearly that God says here, Jesus, in verse 27, so he adds, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? He's talking about our health here. He's really talking about adding to your lifespan. Jesus is saying, look, Worry can add one fraction to your life. Worry cannot add one fraction to your life. Some of you may know of this person. His name is Charles Mayo, the founder of Mayonnaise. No, I'm joking. He's not. <laughs> Charles Mayo started a little clinic called the Mayo Clinic. You know, a lot of um, uh, 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 documents are on the Internet and whatnot. But he says something very interesting, and I'm going to quote him here about worrying. This is what he said, and I quote, Worry affects your circulation, your heart, your glands, your nervous system. I have never met a man or known anyone who has died from working too much, but I've known plenty who have died from worrying too much. You know, Jesus sure knows the human nature, doesn't he? He knows what worry can do. That's why he's teaching on this. It kills us. And worrying doesn't accomplish anything positive in our lives. Nothing positive. In fact, it affects our health big time. 
And for those of you perhaps that have been affected by worry, your health, it, it's very important for us to understand this. I read an article recently that said, uh, that talked about people, how people today are worrying about their health today. And, and a lot of you, and, and what, I'm, what, I'm about, what I'm about to share um, is just facts, not that I'm against these things, but I just want you to understand something that I see as an increase, especially among young people today. But there's a big worry about health. We're a generation today, I believe, of people who are almost out of control about vitamins and supplements. But vitamins and supplements and health, there's TV shows, radio shows, conferences, books and classes, all on health. There's an anxiety over our health, people that want to live longer, people that want to be healthy. And it's interesting because the fear of disease, the fear of illness, um, it, it focuses on uh, us to struggle to stay alive, but to try to kind of control our lifespan. We're trying to add more years to our life, and, and, and it's, it's, it's a preoccupation. It's a preoccupation uh, with, with the body. With, we're priding ourselves with being in shape. And, and again, you know, I'm not against staying healthy. I mean, before I came here today, I had a big lunch at, at uh, Costa Mesa today, and I'm like, I felt guilty. So I went and, and juiced it. You know, I said, I'm going to get something green. I said, give me something green here. You know what I'm saying? So, so, I'm, not, so I'm with you here because you're like, oh, this guy's a nut. No, I'm not. I, I, I'm for health. And God wants living sacrifices, not dead ones, right? So there's nothing wrong with temple maintenance, you know what I'm saying? But what I'm saying is this, is that there's a worry in our, in our society today of people that are just trying to invest so much into gyms and into, into books, into plans to try to stay healthy. There's a preoccupation. And it's funny because even today as I walked into Jamba Juice, that's the best place to juice, um, I walked in there, and the people that were there were all out of their, um, you know, um, gyms. And you see people walking around after their gym, you know, so, and, and it's cool. I mean, again, I'm not against that stuff. But what I see, though, when I watch shows and stuff, is that these, these companies, these, these, these retailers are trying to instill fear in you. You should have this. You should have that. And this will do this to you. This will do that. And then all of a sudden, you're like, I want it all, you know. And then you're walking around all worried about your, your health and this. I mean, there, there's, there, there's got to be a balance to it, don't you think? Be healthy, absolutely, but don't go crazy about it because guess what? God is in control of your life. God is in control of your life. I'm sure there's been a lot of healthy people that have died on the spot from a heart attack. These guys are probably joggers and weightlifters and also like, but this guy, this woman was jogging, was, you know, because they're not in control of their life. And do the best that you can. Stay healthy, of course. I mean, I have two kids. I have a four-year-old, like I said, and a four-month-old. I want to see them grow up. I want to see their, their, their husband, their wife, you know, especially the husband. I want to see who that guy is. Anyways, but, but you know, I, I, I want to see them grow up. You know, I don't want to jack up my health where they're going to have a weak dad who can't get up out of bed. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I want to stay healthy. I do. As long as they keep in and out, we're doing good, right? <laughs> but again, the preoccupation of all of this is a form of worry, trying to stay alive longer. And again, I want to be... I want to live exactly as long as God wants me to live. But I really can't lengthen my life. I mean, I can do good on my health and all of that. But, you know, we need to be careful. We need to have a balance. The next thing that Jesus says in verse 28 to 30, says, he says this, another necessity of life is clothing. Clothing. Notice what he says in verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, neither spin or toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the, the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow it is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you a little faith? Let me say this real quickly. Husbands will use this against their wives. <laughs> See, honey, look right there. No more mall shopping. No, no, listen. It doesn't say that. Listen, God is not speaking against fashion. He's not speaking against, you know, the choices that we have today, color, attire, style. He's not, in, he's not against that. The point is this, is that you're not going to be, care, uh, the point is worrying about, the, uh, worrying so much that you're not going to be cared for by God. That's what he's saying. But he's not against fashion. Now, what about these lilies? He compares this whole analogy with, with, with lilies, and he says, you know, the lilies. Now, we really don't, under, don't really know what kind of flowers Jesus is actually referring to, but a lot of scholars believe that th uh, these were the wildflowers that grew in that area. And according to their description, these flowers are beautiful, 
They were colorful. They had an amazing texture. And the design of these flowers were just amazing. So Jesus compares them to Solomon's attire. And he really dogs Solomon big time. Because look what he says this about Solomon and his threads. You know, he says this. He says, I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Jesus compares the expensive style of Solomon and says that if you were to take the finest fabric that Solomon ever wore and you, you look at its design, its beauty, that cannot compare to the beauty and color of these wildflowers. In other words, it makes Solomon's robe look like old rags. I mean, that's pretty crazy because Solomon, man, he, he knew how to dress, I'm sure. He had the money for it. And, and we see here that he emphasizes in verse 30, basically, he says, you know, that the beauty of these flowers and how God takes care of the flowers, you, need, you, you never see flowers worrying about their beauty. It's given by God. He sustains them, and yet they have a short lifespan, or you have a longer lifespan than a flower. So again, do not worry about those things. Are they not more valuable than flowers, more valuable than birds? So again, Jesus is making it very, very clear that if the creator of the universe, your heavenly father, creates, uh, who created us, uh, human beings, our master creation, if he created us, don't you think that he's going to take care of you? Don't you think he's going to clothe you and provide for you? That's the point, that God does care more than these things. He's driving this home. And then he says, oh, you a little faith, demonstrating a lack of faith. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Notice it says needs, not wants. Needs. It doesn't say God shall supply all my wants. It's needs. God is not going to make you rich because you're asking for it. But what God is going to do, he will supply all your needs. That's what it says here. You know, Paul was a tent maker. That was his job. That's how God supplied for his needs is by being a tent maker. He worked and he was still involved in the ministry. So how does Jesus conclude this? Notice what he says in verse 31 and 32. Therefore, do not worry. Do not say, uh, therefore, do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knows that you need all of these things. But first, or from, but, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own, own things. Suff, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. When Jesus says the Gentiles seek after, this, after these things, Jesus is saying, look, the ones who worry are those who do not have God as their savior. The ones who worry are the ones who don't care about God. They, they, they don't look at God as their provider. These are the ones who hoard their stuff. Uh, these are the ones that, that, that do, that, um, who worry about material things because they, have God, they don't have God in their lives. That's all they have is what they see here on earth. And Jesus says, don't be like those who don't know God. They, they, they have a right to worry because they don't have me in their lives. And therefore, they're looking to the world for, for, for food. They're looking to the world for, for comfort. But me, he says, for you as my child, as my daughter, he says, listen, I'm going to provide for you. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to care for you. Don't worry about that. And then I love what he says in verse 33. He says, seek first the kingdom of God. In other words, put God's kingdom first. Make God your first priority in life. Look to him as your heaven. Remember who he is. Understand that, that God takes care of you. In everything we do, God should be the first person we go to for guidance and for our needs. I love how he just says that. First, seek first the kingdom of God. You know, sometimes worry will take the place of God in our lives. We should kind of change it up and instead of putting worry first, replace it with God. If you're worrying here tonight, just say, Lord, I'm worrying, uh, worrying about this. Uh, I'm worried about that. You know what? Let God take care of that. Say, Lord, here's my worry. Here you go. And let him take that because he's going to do something with it. And then that's where he gives you the peace. That's where he sustains you. Colossians 3.2 says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. 
All these things, it says, will be added unto you. In other words, all the basics of life. Since God is our provider, we know he will take care of us. He will provide for all of our needs. But we must choose to seek him. We must choose to seek his kingdom and righteousness first. It's a choice. It's a choice that you have. The choice that I have is to seek him first. He doesn't force us to seek him. And we see very clearly that Jesus wants us to be concerned with putting him first instead of worrying about the daily things in life. There's a verse that my wife and I hold on to as a, as a married couple, as a family. This is this one, there's two verses actually in Proverbs that I want to take you to that, that we just hold on to as our life verse. If you guys turn with me to Proverbs 30, verse 8 and 9. Proverbs 30, 8 and 9. This is what we hold on to, our life verse, I guess, if you, if you will. Proverbs 30, 8 and 9. It says this. Remove falsehood and lies far from me. That's for my wife. Um, <laughs> and here's the part for our marriage. You ready? Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. I don't want to be a billionaire. I also don't want to be poor. I want to be in the middle. Lord, provide for me daily. Provide for me daily. Because if, if you overdo it, and maybe you know my heart, Lord, maybe I'll be like, who is the Lord? Or perhaps I get so low and become very needy that I may steal and dishonor the name of my God. Lord, keep me in the middle. That's the life I want to live. I want to live in the middle. And that is why Jesus says, do not worry about tomorrow. He ends with that. Notice what he says there. He says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. There are people who live their lives today worrying about tomorrow. The troubles of today are enough, aren't they? I mean, seriously, I mean, it's just things that you go through every day. Perhaps you had a hard day at work. Perhaps you had a hard day at home. Something happened. You got a phone call. Maybe you got in an accident. I don't know. But you're like, this is tough. Listen, just today was enough. Why worry about tomorrow? You know, it's wrong, obviously, to, to be worrying over and over and over. Because I believe worry can warp your personality. It can steal your joy. It can rob your peace. It can destroy relationships. It can cripple your faith. It can harm your health. And it can hinder your Christian testimony. That's what it does. But we need to be careful that we don't focus on the past too much or the future. But focus on where you're at today. Today I am here at church, and the Lord brought me here. And I go home and lay my head on my pillow, and I know that if the Lord wills, there will be a new day tomorrow. And if there's a new day tomorrow, I'll look up and say, Lord, good morning. Thank you for today. And you live out that day in Christ. Someone once said this, and I quote, God wants us to remember the past, plan for the future, but live in the present. God is the God of your tomorrow. He already planned your tomorrow out to me already. Did you know that? I mean, you're right now, you're probably thinking, okay, what do I do tomorrow? I got this at work. I got this. He already planned it out for you. You just by faith wake up in the morning, if it be his will, and you just go, out, go about in your day. And the Lord will, will show you the things he already prepared for you. Even things that you weren't even planning for. You know, there's a cool hymn that uh, I want to leave you with that says this, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth living just because he lives. Amen.